We are going to start a new chapter, proteins. Proteins are highly complex polymers, and these polymers are built from monomer monomers called amino acids. At the elemental level, proteins contain carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and sulfur. Their synthesis occurs in ribos ribosomes. Proteins play a central role in biological systems. Enzymes are proteins. There are thousands of enzymes. Each one of them catalyzes a highly specific biological reaction in cells. They perform the chemical and biochemical processes that sustain the life of a cell. In addition to enzymes, proteins also function as structural components of cells and complex organisms such as collagen, keratin, elastin, etc. So how do we classify proteins? Different protein classifications can be done based on different properties and depending on the subject matter. Let's see them. They can be classified based on the various biological functions of proteins. As I mentioned before, they function as enzyme catalysts and storage proteins. Storage proteins are found mainly in eggs and plant seeds. These proteins act as sources of nitrogen and amino acids for germinating seeds and embryos. In addition, they are characterized as structural proteins, contractile proteins, hormones, for example, insulin, growth hormone, transport proteins, for example, hemoglobin, to transport oxygen in the blood, and antibodies like immunoglobulins and protective proteins, toxins and allergens. Another classification can be done based on composition. It's because of cytoplasmic enzyme modification. After synthesis in ribosomes, Cytoplasmic enzymes modify some amino acid constituents and this changes the elemental composition of some proteins. According to that, proteins that are not enzymatically modified in cells are called homoproteins. Not enzymatically modified. They are simple proteins. And those that are modified or complex with non-protein components are called conjugated proteins or heteroproteins. These non-protein components are often referred to as prosthetic groups. Non-protein components. Examples include nucleoproteins or lipoproteins. Nucleoproteins contains nucleic acids and lipoproteins contains lipids. There's a lipid protein interaction. And these complexes can be dissociated under appropriate conditions with heat or acid. Let's see another classification.
proteins also can be classified according to their three-dimensional structural organization. Here we are talking about shape. We have two types, globular proteins or fibrous proteins. Globular proteins are those that exist in spherical or ellipsoidal shapes. resulting from uh, folding of the polypeptide chains on itself. So they are folded proteins. On the other hand, fibrous proteins are rod-shaped molecules. looks like a rod. They contain twisted linear polypeptide chains. Fibrous proteins also can be formed as a result of linear aggregation of small globular proteins. The aggregation of these small globular proteins can result in this linear polypeptide chain. Fibrous proteins are generally uh, structural proteins such as collagen, keratin and elastin found in hair and skin. Okay, let's move on. Amino acids. So the building blocks that proteins are made of are called amino acids. Natural proteins contain up to 20 primary amino acids. They are linked together via peptide bonds. These 20 amino acids all have distinct structures and unique properties. With a couple of important exceptions, uh, we can classify them as charged or uncharged. Some amino acids have functional groups that can carry a charge depending on the pH, pH of the environment. They can also be hydrophobic or hydrophilic depending on the solubility in water, which is about the polarity of their structure. Charged amino acids tend to be more water soluble. They ionize in water. And this peptide bond, also called amide bond or amide linkage okay they are the same thing okay let's continue so these are the primary amino acids there are 20 amino acids in this slide so all proteins are essentially made up of these primary 20 amino acids but some proteins do not contain all 20 amino acids in their structure. Actually, there is one newly discovered, um, discovered amino acid. And in some books, in some chapters, it says there are 21 amino acids in total. But uh, for this lecture, we will still consider there are 20 amino acids. Okay, total 20. The differences in structure and function of the proteins arise from the sequence in which the amino acids are linked together via peptide bonds. Literally, billions of proteins with unique properties can be synthesized by using these 20 amino acids. So how can we do that? By changing 
the amino acid sequence. Amino acid sequence. And what else? The type and the ratio of amino acids. and chain length of polypeptides. So billions of proteins with different structures and functions can be obtained by this way. Okay, let's see the structure of these amino acids. Here you see the basic structure. Chemically, we call them alpha amino acids. Alpha. Why? Because of the presence of alpha carbon in its structure. Here you see the central alpha carbon. Each amino acid has this central alpha carbon that has a hydrogen attached to it. It's covalently attached, a covalent bond. What else do we see here? There is also an amino group, an H2, on this side. It is amino group. That's why we call them amino acids. Also, we can say amine group. And on the other side, we have a COOH attached to central carbon. So what's that functional group? It's carboxyl group. You will remember from the bits. So we have carboxyl group on this side. And then, on the top, you see side chain R group. So this R group is very important. Because amino acids differ only in the chemical nature of the side chain of R group. So this R group is different for each individual amino acid we saw in the previous slide, those 20 amino acids. Each one of them is differentiated by its R site group, so that's how we know what each one is. Okay, The amino group in H2, the carboxyl group, COOH, alpha central carbon and the hydrogen are all the same for all amino acids. But then the one thing that, they, that uh, they have different is what is in their R side group. That's the only difference. So based on that, we can say that the physiochemical properties such as the physiochemical properties of amino acids, such as net charge, solubility, and then chemical reactivity, and hydrogen bonding potential. So they are all dependent on the chemical nature of the R group.
okay? Because the rest is the same. So these R groups can be acidic or basic. or they can be water soluble so which affects the polarity polarity of the amino acids so these are just examples it goes like that okay let's continue let's see some examples Here you see some examples of amino acids. They are distinguished by their R groups. So we have glutamic acid here. So what is the R group? So we have a very polar carboxylic acid here. As we said, we normally have carboxylic acid here in each amino acid, but this is additional one. This is the R group. So the presence of this carboxylic acid makes the structure very polar. And depending on the pH, the glutamic acid can carry negative charge. On the other hand, we have phenylalanine. It, uh, it has a bulky nonpolar benzene ring as R group. Sorry. And the presence of this benzene ring makes these amino acids non-polar. because of this non-polar benzene ring. And we also have lysine here. So lysine amino acid contains an amine group here. And that is an unusually strong nucleophile. This amine group. So it can react with reducing sugars. So then what happens? So remember, what is this reaction? It's Maillard reaction, right? So at the end of this reaction, lysine is quickly destroyed and non-enzymatic browning occurs. Okay, let's move on. So let's learn about the stereochemistry of the amino acids. So every amino acid except glycine can occur in two isomeric forms because of the possibility of forming two different stereoisomers around the central carbon atom. So this means that there are mirror images of their structure. It's just like how we have left hands and right hands, like here, like, like this figure. So that's why uh, they are labeled L alanine, like left handed.
and D avenue. Right hand. To distinguish the mirror images. It's like we have hydrogen here and here, like the mirror images. This one and this one. So there is a there is a chirality. Same com chemical formula, different configuration. Stereoisomers. Only L amino acids are manufactured in cells and incorporated into proteins. Some D amino acids are found in the cell walls of bacteria, but not in bacterial proteins. So we said that glycine is the exception. So let's see the structure. What is the reason for that? Let's go to other slide. So here is the structure. Here, glycine. So it's, it's the simplest amino acid. So it has no steroisomers because it has two hydrogen atoms, atoms attached to the central carbon atom here. One, two. So the R group is hydrogen. So only when all four attachments are different, then we can have steroisomers. Because of these two hydrogen atoms, there is no sterilism of glycine. Okay, we'll just read. Okay, let's continue. Okay, let's see the acid-base chemistry of amino acids. Amino acids act as either an acid or a base because they contain a carboxylic group, which is acidic, and an, an amino group, which is basic. So they behave both as acid and bases. So let me write. Amino group basic acidic. Let's see the figure. At around neutral pH, both the amino and carboxyl groups are ionized, and the molecule is called a dipolar or zwitter ion. Dipolar ion. or zwitter ion. The pH at which the dipolar ion is electrically neutral is called the isoelectric point. The net charge of the protein is zero at isoelectric point. If protein is composed of that amino acids, then the net charge of that protein will be zero. When the dipolar ion is titrated with an acid, the carboxyl groups become protonated. And the pH when these concentrations are equal, known as pKa1. 
Similarly, when the dipolar ion is titrated with a base, amino groups becomes deprotonated. So as before, so when these concentrations are equal, the pH is known as pKa2. Okay, dipolar ion protonated with hydrogen this way. And deprotonated this way. Lose hydrogen. So net charge of the amino acids determines their solubility behavior in solution or in water. So it's important how they ionize in water or in solution, how they interact with the solution or the other molecules in the solution. In this table, the pKa values of all the ionizable groups in amino acids are given. Here, pK is equal to pKa. Same thing. The subscripts 1 to this is r also it's equal to pk3 so they refer to carboxyl amino and r side chain ionizable groups the isoelectric points of amino acids are given here in this column but they can also be estimated using their pKa values, these three pKa values, by using this following expression, expressions in the other slide, these equations. As an example, we want to calculate the isoelectric point of aspartic acid. We go to the table, get all pKa values, three of them. It's an acidic amino acid. As the name says, it's aspartic acid. So we are going to pick that equation. and calculate the isoelectric point of aspartic acid, which is 2.77. So let me look at the table. Yes, 2.77. Okay, we found isoelectric pH, but why it's important? What does isoelectric pH tell us? I mean, the isoelectric point. So that means at isoelectric point or at isoelectric pH, the solubility of amino acids or proteins minimum. Okay, the solubility in a solution or in water. But below or, or above isoelectric point, maybe I will write like this, the solubility can increase. It 
depends on the pH of the solution. But it's minimum at isoelectric point or at isoelectric pH. Okay? This is important. Okay, let's move on. Amino acids are linked together via peptide bonds and assembled in several stages to form different structures of proteins. There are four main protein structures. Primary structure, secondary structure, tertiary structure, and quaternary structure. So as you see in the figures, they have different structural organizations. Let's start with the primary structure. Primary structure is the linear sequence of amino acids. So amino acids are covalently linked via peptide bonds. So in this figure we have two amino acids with two different R groups. And these two amino acids being joined to form a dipeptide. It's a dehydration process because water is also formed as a product. So this is the peptide bond. Here the amine group of one uh, amino acid here, the amine group, reacts with the carboxylic acid group of another amino acid here. These two react. Water is eliminated and peptide bond formed. So this is our D-peptide. It's composed of two amino acids. So this D-peptide still has a reactive amino and carboxylic acid group. Or we can just call it carboxyl group. And they can continue to react to form sequentially larger polypeptides and eventually a complete protein. Like this. So in this polypeptide, the terminus with free amino group is known as N terminal or N terminus. And the one with carboxyl group, C terminus. So N represents the beginning and C the end of the polypeptide chain. The primary structure is often written as a sequence of amino acids using three letter or one letter abbreviations like this. It starts with N. beginning and end. Amino acid sequence. The amino acid sequence acts as the code for formation of secondary and tertiary structures and eventually determines the protein's biological functionality. The molecular weight of most proteins is in the range of 20,000 to 100,000 delta. Secondary structure. Secondary structure refers to certain regular arrangements by which polypeptides fold into more compact shapes. 
some more compact. Yeah, this structure arises from the interactions and folding of the primary structure onto itself. There are different uh, folding patterns. In general, general, two forms of regular secondary structures are found in proteins. These are like helical structures and extended shield-like structures. Alpha helix structures, beta sheet structures. So they stabilize by forming hydrogen bonds. Alpha helix is the major form of secondary structure in proteins. It's stabilized by hydrogen bonding. One term is equal to 3.6 amino acids, as you see here. One term of helix. So, folding of a polypeptide chain to form alpha helix structure occur because of the formation of hydrogen bonds. Let's continue with the beta sheet. So it's another type of secondary structure. So in a beta sheet, polypeptides line up either parallel or anti-parallel with another. It can be parallel the strands run in the same direction or anti-parallel. The strands run in opposite directions. So hydrogen bonds can form between interchain. Beta sheet structure is more stable than alpha helix. Another common structural feature found in protein is the beta term or beta band. It arises as a result of 180 degree reversal of the polypeptide, polypeptide chain. So it is turning polypeptide chain makes a rapid 180 degree turn. Okay, I'm going to write here. Usually, a beta band involves a four residue segment folding back on itself. And this band is stabilized by a hydrogen bond. So here we said amino acid residue. Actually, it's the amino acid. So when we form polypeptide, each amino acid is called a residue because it forms a part of the polypeptide. Okay, beta turn in involves four amino acid residue segment. It means uh, it's for amino acids long. The common am amino acids in beta, beta turn are okay, I really write common, common, common amino acids. 
I'm going to use three letter abbreviations. ASP for aspartic acid. Then cysteine and asparagin. Tyrosine Glycine So it will be TYR and proline It's pro Okay, that's it for beta term Tertiary structure of proteins. Most proteins continue folding beyond the secondary folding that creates regions of alpha helix or beta sheet. This next level of folding is called tertiary folding. So tertiary folding can result from one or more of several types of bonding. So it's a compact three-dimensional form. There are several forces that stabilize the tertiary protein structure, such as hydrogen bond, hydrophobic interactions, electrostatic interactions, and disulfide bonds. And here you see all the details. Hydrogen bonding between backbone and side chain groups. Hydrophobic bonding, in which hydrophobic side chain, chains associate together to remove themselves from water. The pre presence of uh, disulfide bonds gives protein additional strength, but not every protein has disulfide bonds. Also, there are other forces like Van der Waal forces and some steric strains. These are weak, but they contribute to overall energy of stabilization. And last protein structure is the quaternary structure. Some pro proteins contain multiple polypeptide chains, resulting in quaternary structure. Quaternary structures are held together by the same types of chemical bonds that are found in tertiary structures, including a variety of weak bonds and disulfide bridges. They can be made up of protein subunits, monomers, that are the same, like homopolymers, or different, like heteropolymers. Okay, that's all for this lecture. Let me know if you have any questions.